In the words of the great Tlingit nation, Tungus means of the sea and by the land. With more than 1,000 named islands, thousands of lakes and endless fjords, truly it's hard to tell where the land ends and the sea begins. Designated a national forest by President Theodore Roosevelt in 1907, the Tongass is the largest of all the national forests. Roughly 100 miles wide and approximately 500 miles long, it forms the southeastern Alaska panhandle. Here, the U.S. Forest Service is entrusted with a territory larger than the states of Delaware, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Congress mandated that the national forests would be managed under a multiple use policy to provide water, timber, forage, minerals, recreation and wildlife in perpetuity. Management of this approximately 17 million acre domain has always been subject to the dynamics of multiple use and the conflicts inherent with it. But despite these controversies, much of the Tongass remains as it was at the turn of the century. To serve the public interest, almost one-third of the Tongass has been designated as wilderness or national monument. The Forest Service manages three national monuments, Misty Fjords in South Tongass, Mount St. Helens in Washington, and Admiralty Island. They are congressionally mandated exceptions to the Forest Service multiple use policy. These national monuments are specifically managed to protect objects of ecological, cultural, geological, historical, prehistorical, and scientific interest. Admiralty Island is the third largest of the islands within the Tongass. Since 1930, its fate has been held in contention between conservationists who saw the lush rainforest and dense brown bear and bald eagle habitats as sacred, and those who advocated multiple use for this land. In 1972, a geologist flying over the north end of the island saw a large landslide with massive oxidation above Greens Creek. Exploration of the slide revealed a large mineral deposit containing lead, zinc, gold, and silver. The deposit, later named Greens Creek, spurred development of the largest silver mine in North America. Between 1973 and 1986, Continuous mineral exploration was approved by the Forest Service. These activities were supported by helicopter to minimize impacts on the land. Historically, mining has been an important activity in the Tongass. Gold, silver, and copper mining were pivotal in the development and growth of Southeast Alaska. Indeed, it continues to be important, not only for Alaska, but for the entire country. The minerals beneath the ground here are as much a national treasure as the other values of the monument. In 1978, after surface drilling established that there was a substantial ore body, the Forest Service issued a permit for an exploratory adit, or shaft, at elevation 1350. A small construction camp was established on the mountain to support the tunneling and surface drilling operations. Access to this isolated camp was totally dependent upon helicopters. This was very expensive, but environmentally, it was the most responsible approach. Then underground drilling was started to further define the ore body. In late 1978, President Carter designated most of Admiralty Island a national monument. By then, it had become clear that Greens Creek was a major load of national significance. Monument designation specifically allowed work to continue, provided other monument values were protected. In 1980, the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, ANILCA, reaffirmed the monument designation and classified all of the monument as wilderness, except for the Greens Creek drainage. Congress recognized the special values of Admiralty Island. However, at the same time, Congress recognized the very valuable mineral deposit at Greens Creek, and in doing so, they made special provisions for the future development of the mine. With the passage of the Alaska Lands Act, Congress only gave the Forest Service very broad direction and guidelines. Within those broad guidelines, then, the Forest Service had the responsibility to 
facilitate the development of the mine in a environmentally sound manner. Compatible to the maximum extent feasible with the purpose for which the monument was established. In order to determine what the maximum extent feasible meant, we had to bring together the environmental community, the communities around the area, state and local agencies, as well as the Greens Creek Mining Company. Interpretation of congressional intent usually occurs at higher levels within the Forest Service. Mineral development in a national monument such as the Greens Creek Project was uncharted territory. The monument manager took on significant decision-making responsibilities. The Greens Creek Mine is the first underground mine to develop in Alaska since 1944. So as we proceeded with public involvement, we had to go through a learning process that included not only the public, but the agencies and the Forest Service as well. The Forest Service role, as mandated by Congress, is to serve the public's various needs by finding the fine point of balance between development and preservation. Admiralty Island National Monument was the focus for environmental concern in southeast Alaska. All kinds of people had an interest in the National Monument. We recognized that all the diverse interest groups, local, regional, and national, had to have a role in the process. When uh, Greens Creek was proposing to have uh, develop the mine on Admiralty Island, Kutznu always had a concern and the village of Angoon for the environment and uh, was a major player in the negotiations to uh, develop plans for the mine that would uh, protect the subsistence lifestyle of the island. You know, I don't have to tell you that Angoon's always been a protector of the island and has uh, put its money where its mouth is in uh, keeping us pure. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of discussion and uh, made commitments at the hearing to Angoon. Our life is uh, strictly subsistence. It isn't like the other communities. The Forest Service acted as a catalyst between the mining company and such diverse groups as the fishermen, environmentalists, and general public, trying to maintain an open door and open mind on all of the issues. The first hurdle was to convince the company to buy into a very open planning process where the concerns of the environmental community and others were considered. In 1980, the Forest Service examined the issues and mitigation associated with exploration with a detailed environmental assessment. As a result, an exploration permit was issued with specific guidelines for conduct and mitigation. The Forest Service then had to notify the public that an environmental impact statement, EIS, would be written for the proposed development of the mine and to appoint an interdisciplinary team, an IDT, which would be responsible for collecting baseline data and conducting the analysis. The draft EIS was released in August 1982 with a two-month period for public comment. I moved to southeast Alaska in January 1981, and that's when I first became aware of the Greens Creek Mine. Mm -hmm. And we immediately went to work looking at the different issues that were going to be facing us um, as you know, environmentalists looking at a mine and a national monument. And there were a number that were at the top of our list. The first one was, are they going to build a community in Hawk Inlet? I mean, the last thing in the world we wanted was another town over there. Um, and of course, another one of our major concerns was water quality and what kind of runoff were you going to get from the mine itself and also from the tailings pond, what kind of impact was going to happen to Greens Creek, what was that going to do to the fisheries. Uh, the disturbance in the areas related to wildlife, especially grizzly bears, was you know, top on our list. Another concern that we had was the access. You know, where was the road going to be built, the proximity to the stream? If they weren't going to build a town in Hawk Inlet, how were they going to get the people from Juneau? I know that there was you know, several different scenarios for bringing the people over from Juneau and, you know, if that facilitated a road, where was the road going to be? Those are the main issues um, that we had as environmentalists. Our task as an IDT was, was to involve those groups who were particularly concerned about various aspects of the, pro the project, not only the public in general, but agencies that had responsibility for various resource protection, such as the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, uh, Department of Environmental Quality, other state and federal agencies. One of the questions the Department of Fish and Game was concerned about is to what extent will this project and development affect the life habits of the bears who live in Greens Creek? 
uh, the company uh, funded a, a partially funded a study which al allowed uh, Dr. John Shane to uh, mark and identify bears. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, the project development does not seem to have caused significant behavior changes from the bears who live in this area. The bears still use Greens Creek, they still use the Delta, they follow their natural, normal behavior patterns, and uh, we feel like this has been both good information to have in general, and it also uh, allows us to say with some confidence that as far as the bears go, the Greens Creek project has been a success. The company assumed a partnership type of an attitude from the beginning so that uh, when we met with the federal agencies and especially the, the Forest Service, that uh, we would be able to establish a trust. The basic corporate philosophy to respect and be responsive to all public concerns was extended to the environmental community as well. So they sort of held out the olive branch and I accepted it. And as we began working together and began to build the trust level. Because of that trust, we were able to be open with each other and to solve problems in a, in a very fast and, and timely manner. It was like, oh, thank God, these people aren't gonna be fighting each other. And from then on, it became the three organizations, the environmentalists, the Naranda people, and the Forest Service working together, you know, over a two-year period to develop a, a mine environmental statement so that it, the project could go forward and it would not be appealed and the environment would be protected, which is everybody got what they wanted. Resolving the issues and, and developing options required that, that all of these, these divergent groups have an opportunity to participate in a project that in effect that they all assume some ownership for the outcome of the project it was clear from the beginning that there really was not going to be anyone who was a 100 percent winner that all groups would have to sacrifice something some form of compromise to reach the best possible solution for, for managing this project the forest service was very fortunate in that we had the idt remain in place during the entire planning process and actually into the construction and operational phase we don't often have that luxury i think it also helped build a lot of credibility with the community with uh, special interest groups and particularly with state and other federal agencies essentially the same forest service personnel tracked the project from planning to full operation accordingly the original agreements and assumptions were not confused or forgotten. By 1983, the Forest Service issued its final environmental impact statement. It was designed to be user-friendly, not massive in size or highly technical. Initial construction activity was to develop temporary housing centered on a parcel of privately owned land known as the cannery a major fish processing center in the early 1900s. From the mine, an eight-mile road would be built to the cannery, and another, more than five miles, would be built to the commuter dock at Young Bay. At this point, the Forest Service expanded its staff to cope with the dual track of exploration and road and camp construction. During this time, ownership of the project sold, and the Greens Creek Mining Company was formed to develop and operate the mine. In 1986, the pace of road building took a quantum leap when it was decided to accelerate the completion of the access road by using helicopters to move heavy equipment into four selected locations along the right-of-way. From these isolated pockets, equipment would be reassembled and worked toward each other. This multiplied the effective road building capability by seven and equally increased the need for Forest Service oversight at each location. Although this use of helicopters was expensive, it greatly reduced the impact of the construction footprint on the environment. It also greatly accelerated the process. The Forest Service continuously monitored all aspects of the approximately 14 miles of road construction and other major work to ensure that it conformed to the environmental impact statements, the project general plan of operation, annual work plans, and various leases and permits. In compressing several seasons of work into one, the process strained the logistical and personnel resources of the Forest Service. 
We couldn't anticipate everything, of course. Things were really crazy for quite some time with all the different activity going on. The road construction effort was one of the toughest in North America. The task was complicated by unstable soils, steep terrains, wet conditions, lack of competent rock, and inadequate waste storage areas. Gravel for resurfacing the road ultimately had to be barged in from the Juneau area. The final cost was more than $1 million per mile. The Forest Service created a fast track process to cope effectively with the fast and multifaceted development of the project. The process provided for expedited review and comment on designs and plans and imposed rules on the company and the Forest Service for the plan submittal and review process. The process held both parties accountable for their actions. It did not change the way of doing business, only the pace. The process reduced the frustration and expense of wasted time by ensuring that submittals were complete and that the Forest Service review team was available for timely consideration of the proposal. The Forest Service did on occasion actually stop construction of the project due to bad blasts, landslides, or excessive sedimentation entering the creeks. Pauses such as these were not popular with the company, however, they were critical if the project was to be successfully completed with minimum impact to the environment. The approach the Forest Service took during the project was very proactive versus reactive. They had people on site, and as problems arose, we were able to meet almost immediately to discuss the problems, to develop solutions to the problems. It was probably the most professional approach of uh, any government agency that I've worked with in the last 15 years in three different states. And it was, uh, it was just nice to work with this kind of a, a proactive approach to, uh, to implementing and, and developing a project. Greens Creek had five ownership changes and three major staff changes before construction ended. This required the Forest Service to reacquaint the new people with existing directions, agency sensitivities, and agreements. And it was necessary to develop new relationships. At the peak of construction, Greens Creek proposed major changes for the development and operation of the mine. When the company came to us proposing changing from wet tailing storage to dry, we recognized that it was probably beneficial, but also recognized we'd made a deal with our partners in the original EIS. Uh, analysis. Yeah, like so we had to go back and analyze the effects of the change. This proposal reduced the land required for tailing storage from approximately 150 to 35 acres. The proposal would increase ore production from 800 to 1,000 tons per day, increase the requirement for mill water from 250 to 700 gallons per day. It would require truck transport of the tailings and realignment of the mine water discharge pipe from the settling pond to Hawk Inlet. And we also had to bring this information back to the public and, and validate the change in the decision. Everybody had to stop and regroup at considerable time and expense to produce a second environmental assessment. It took almost an entire year, but the payoff was an environmentally and economically superior project. In 1987 and 1988, the project activities reached a crescendo with more than 50 contractors and subcontractors infusing almost 500 people into the narrow corridor of 147 acres. Major activity included construction of the mill site, two marine terminals, and the tailing basin, which began in the fall of 1987 and was completed by the winter of 88-89. Meanwhile, miners were driving a new 2,500-foot adit adjacent to the mill site to begin full development of the ore body.
through it all, the Forest Service constantly directed the company to keep up with the revegetation as required by the project authorizations to improve soil stability, reduce sedimentation, and enhance appearance of the site. To avoid confusion, the Forest Service had to define clear and distinct links of communication with the company. Only key individuals were authorized to give instructions to the company, and in no case were Forest Service specialists allowed to give instructions to company contractors. The documentation of daily work and verbal agreements was vital. Great emphasis was given to the need to set up good record-keeping systems and to keeping all agencies and the public involved as needed or as courtesy dictated. Almost as suddenly as it began, the surge of activities was over, and there appeared the completed mine and mill ready for full production. Bringing the mine and the mill online was not an easy thing to do, as you can imagine. And many people didn't believe an operation of this scope was possible in a national monument. And yet here we are today, dedicating a complex that is already producing valuable minerals. What made this a success? I think there are a lot of reasons, but three important ones are, first, the company's upfront decision to acknowledge the environmental sensitivity of this area. The company was committed to the long-term goals of developing the mine being a respected leader in the corporate community. And from day one, the company has demonstrated that it believes environmental sensitivity makes good business sense. Secondly, everyone involved with the project approached it with an attitude of solving problems quickly instead of arguing over technicalities. And I'm proud that the Forest Service has been able to be a part of this and help make it possible. Working together, we've been able to utilize the resources of the Tongass National Forest to help provide for a stabilizing diversity of the economy without impacting other opportunities for the public to use and enjoy their land. We think Greens Creek Project will continue to serve as an excellent model for others to follow. The Forest Service switched from administration of the planning and construction phase to monitoring the operational phase. Besides detailed biological and water quality monitoring, the Forest Service added numerous monitoring requirements, checks for leaks in waste lines, procedures for handling reagents and detecting soil and water contamination. We are continuously watching the project to assure that terms and conditions specified in the environmental statement, the various plans and permits are met. And this is done through a staff of people working for Admiralty National Monument that go out on a, a regular basis. The Forest Service will continue to take the lead for this successful partnership between federal and state agencies, the mining company, and the public. We will continue to fulfill our responsibilities to manage the mine, as well as care for the values of the National Monument. That elusive balance between development and preservation achieved here by reasonable people working as a team has become a monument within a monument, a balance directed by law, but realized through trust, and a commitment to that pristine blend of land and sea they call admiralty. <laughs>